everyone, and welcome to our first May episode of UFC Rankings Report. For us, how exactly are the rankings decided? Each week, a panel of journalists ranks the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters as well as the best in each weight class. Yeah, and today we're talking about the rankings that are out May 16th. UFC 224, which took place in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. That's, I was there, so I feel like now I can right, say it right. like that. You know? Good enough, Skyline Miles. Right, yeah. <laughs> the champion Amanda Nunes retained her title and is holding strong at number 12 on the pound-for-pound -pound list. Her opponent, Raquel Pennington, dropped two spots at number four at women's bantamweight. Forrest, you know, when you looked at this matchup ahead of time, I'm not sure a lot of people necessarily thought it would go to the fifth round. Did you expect it to? So I didn't love the fight for Raquel because I think Raquel's more talented than that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but she's coming off like a 14-month yes, layoff. Yes, she had, and she had an she incredibly brutal injury to her leg. Hadn't made that weight in a long time. Coming off an injury, you don't really want to step into the championship fight. But before her injury, she had kind of earned that 14 months sure. ago. So, I, you know, I would like to see her get like a bounce back fight and, you know. Yeah, and she took on the champion in her Who's home country. Who's a dominant champion. Exactly. Yeah. What did you take away though from Amanda's performance? Well, she, she was patient, she's well-rounded, she never gets flustered, and she looked confident and in control that whole week, that whole fight. Yeah, still still number 12 on the pound for pound list. Really fun champion to watch in the UFC. But I'm excited to see her fight Cyborg, just saying. If it happens, we'll be watching. It should happen. <laughs> I agree with that. All right, well, also at UFC 224, the co-main event was just absolutely bananas as Kelvin Gastelum defeated Jacare Souza, moving up one spot in the rankings to number four. Well, Jacare moved down three spots to number five. Forrest, do you believe Kelvin should get the first shot at the winner of Whitaker versus Romero? You know, that that is a great question. Here's the thing about Kelvin. I just keep underestimating him, and I'm not going to quit underestimating him. <laughs> So I, I would love to, I think him and Robert Whitaker are actually very similar. They're both coming up from 170. Mm -hmm. They both win because they're quick. Um, I think, you know, Yoel Romero is kind of the unknown. He did lose to Weidman, yes. which makes me think that Yoel could kind of get him there. But I, I, I think there's a chance he beats Whitaker. Yeah, he continues so to improve. So my advice for Calvin is avoid Yoel Romero, fight uh, Robert Whitaker, and you can be champion at 185. Uh, after four said you couldn't do it and you should move back down to 170 with <laughs> So prove me wrong. Right, okay, people love to do that. But also, we just have to mention, Kelvin is in his mid-20s. There is yeah. so much potential still for him. And boy, has he got a chin. He's oh got a chin, gosh. he knows he's got a chin, very confident with it, you know. He's got a chin, power, he doesn't get tired. When he was almost being submitted, he didn't panic. So exactly. Jacques Ray was burning all that injury. He was just kind of like, okay, I'm cool, I'm cool, I can get out of this. And he did. Yeah, they, and were, it showed. they were both exhausted after the fight. You know, backstage, Kelvin was drinking some water. Jacques Ray was sitting just feet away. He was so tired, you know. And then Kelvin said, man, he hits hard. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, he does. Well, so, he didn't process that until the after the fight. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. good for him. It worked out for him. Now, last month, we uh, saw an incredible set of fights in Glendale, Arizona, and the main event was an epic battle between two of the most entertaining lightweights on the entire planet. Poirier versus Gaethje, of course, one fight of the night. Anybody with a brain could have told you that before. This was one of those fights, everybody knew it was gonna be great. So I was almost afraid, what if this fight isn't great? Like, everybody's so hyped up. These guys are both always in great, exciting fights. Yeah. Nope, it lived up to the hype. It An certainly paid fight. off, and it affected the 155 pound ranking where Poirier moved up a spot to number four. Gaethje fell down a spot to number seven. The top four at lightweight now? Conor McGregor, Tony Ferguson. Eddie Alvarez and Dustin Poirier. Forrest, oh my God, let's talk about lightweight. Well, you said, you asked me earlier, is, is Poirier really a contender? Well, this performance shows that he's absolutely a contender. So he is fighting Eddie Alvarez? Yes, a rematch again in Calgary later this summer. That was a great fight, shaping up to be an even greater fight. Can't wait to see that. The next fight, though, I'm a little confused. Where's my boy Kevin Lee fit in? Exactly. Kevin, Kevin Lee, Lee coming over an amazing, I want to say epic performance over Edson Barbosa. I thought he dominated Edson and more than Khabib dominated. Exactly what he said he was going to do. He actually moved up to number five in the lightweight division while Edson slipped his spot to number six. I should start paying attention to when you interview these people. You should. It'd he be did nice. that. I did not know he said that, but he said it and then he did it. That makes it even more impressive. Kevin Lee obviously showed a lot of prowess. He had one scary moment in the fight because Edson Barbosa oh. is dangerous. Yes. 
every single second of the fight. He did. He For one second, he kind of, you know, was thinking ahead of, instead of in that moment, you could tell he was thinking, what am I doing next? Boom, the amazing skates, newborn deer, <laughs> yeah. the meme that lasts forever. But he came back from that, got the takedown, and was able to dominate that fight. So I, I was even more impressed he was able to take that kick and, and survive that. Kevin Lee, also very young, 25 years old, the Motown phenom. There is a bright, bright future for him. Well, we took a look back at the most recent cards, so let's now take a look forward at what we've got coming our way in the next couple of weeks. The Octagon World Tour continues with the UFC's first ever visit to Chile, where number five, Damian Maya, steps in on very short notice to face number seven, Kamaru Usman. Usman, known as the wrestler, Maya, obviously one of the best jiu-jitsu players in the world. Yeah, I don't know how to, you know, kind of predict this matchup. A lot of times when great, a lot of times when great grapplers kind of face each other, they end up in a bit of a stand-up war. And I thought we even saw that a little bit with Covington and Maya. Uh, Maya's always game. Maya's the man. I, I love him at 70. What does a win over Jamie and Maya do for a guy like Usman, who is relatively new in his UFC career? Well, I mean, it'd be huge. It'd obviously propel him, I think, in the top five easily, and, uh, you know, maybe even higher than that. All right, well, we like will Like the see. top three. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens there in Chile. That should be a great one. Well, from South America to Europe, the following weekend's headliners are another pair of welterweights, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who's sitting right at number one in the welterweight division, taking on highly touted prospect number eight, Darren Till, in Till's hometown of Liverpool, England. Eight versus one. Forrest, why is this such a dangerous fight for Stephen Thompson? Because Darren Till is young and he's getting better every fight. So you don't necessarily know what you're getting. I guarantee you that Darren Till we see now will be better than the last one we saw. So he's an improving guy. With, with Stephen Thompson, been in the UFC a ton, fought for the belt multiple times, we know exactly what you're getting. So Darren Till knows exactly what he's preparing for. When you're fighting Till, you don't know exactly what you're preparing for. Good on Stephen Thompson for taking the fight. Yeah, absolutely, especially going over to England to take the fight. What does Stephen Thompson need to do looking at that fight and say, all right, this, this is my game plan against Darren Till? You know, stay away from his power. He needs to move, touch, do his thing, and be Machida-esque. All right, well, we'll see what happens there. Lots of fun welterweight fights coming up in the next couple of weeks. On this episode of Unranked, we put our heads together with some of our colleagues in the office to give nicknames to fighters on upcoming cards who are without a moniker. Although they didn't ask us and probably won't like any of our suggestions or ideas, we decided to do it anyway, and honestly, I... I think I have like a natural ability for this. This is my God-given talent. Let's start with Damian Maya. I'm gonna go with a nickname I think you're also going to take called right. The Backpack. Right, I'm not gonna call him The Backpack. I'm gonna call him... Monchila, Monchila. Monchila, yeah, so The Backpack in Portuguese. Uh, it's weird, all Brazilian fighters have nicknames except for Damian Maya. I know, you know? <laughs> moving on. TJ Dillashaw, he is of course the Bantamweight champion and fights at UFC 227. He has kind of given himself Killashaw, which I like. Um, Can't and, give yourself a nickname, though. But, yeah. But I will say this. You know, a long time ago, um, when TJ was on The Ultimate Fighter, somehow people started putting on his bios and different websites that his nickname was The Viper. It seems apropos, though. It yes! seems like it should be his nickname. Right, and now... He seems like a bad guy out of Cobra Kai with the blonde hair and the cute... You do like that little cute. symbol, like... I think, uh, I think he's a viper. Neil Magny is fighting in Liverpool, sitting at number nine in welterweight division. Uh, someone in our office came up with a really great nickname that we just can't top, the Magnifier. Yeah, Neil the Magnifier, Magny. Moving on, Kelvin Gastelum. He's always the underdog, and you even said earlier in the show you consistently underestimate him, yes, so I'm going yeah. with the dog, like the underdog. <laughs> That's really good, because he fights like a dog. He really does. How about uh, Nate Diaz? I'm going to give him the nickname of the Stockton Strangler. A, because obviously he's an incredible jiu-jitsu black belt but also have you seen the office when they had the scranton strangler it was like a really big storyline and, and forever everyone was wondering who the scranton strangler was i haven't but i like the stockton uh, strangler yeah. he's choked out a lot of people yeah. he's got a great guillotine yeah. finally we've got mackenzie dern who of course fought at ufc 224 she was victoria she's number 15 in the strawweight division her dad is megaton so let's go with mini wait her dad's megaton diaz Oh my god, I didn't know oh that. Oh my god. Oh my god, her dad's one of the best jiu-jitsu uh, teachers in the world. Correct, yeah. Wow. That would be why she's really good at jiu-jitsu. Oh my god. Do you like my nickname of Minitone? Uh, I love it actually, I love it. Well, that's
that's it for what we think was an incredibly productive nicknaming session. Hopefully, you guys. Minotaur. That's that one. That is. Well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I know. You learn something every day, Forrest. Or you learn something when you read the notes of the show. Anyway, that's it for this Obviously episode. Obviously, I don't. We're out.